Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Talking Sense with Alistair Milroy of Breaking the Mold Accounting right here on Yachting International Radio. My name is Ria. I am your co-host. And uh, welcome back, Alistair. Hi, Ria. How are you today? Well, you know, it's Monday and uh, every day you wake up is a good day. So doing well. Good, good. It's another interesting week, isn't it? Oh, you know what? We went straight from all the COVID malarkey right into the Russian-Ukraine uh, war, and um, now we're talking sanctioning of yachts. And just, I think, when people were starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel, we were going to have a beautiful, normal Mediterranean season. This happens. Um, but there's been a lot of controversy over the last week and a bit uh, in regards to the yachts that have been sanctioned and, and what sanctioning means and what they can or cannot do. What does it mean? for a government to sanction a yacht? What, what are those powers? When a yacht or any asset or person is sanctioned, it, it blocks the flow of funds to them. It, it basically it makes it illegal to, for anyone to provide services or goods to that, to that yacht. Um, and that goes from, you know, as an example, someone providing bunkering or food provisions, but it equally would, it could apply to the, the crew not being, it would be breaking the sanctions by being employed um, and providing a service to the yacht. So it, it, it the intention is to you know, make it very difficult to block to for the for the owner to use that asset, whether it be a property, um, and to be able to get funds to and from that. Uh, so that really means also, that I mean, basically anybody, you know, any yacht. There cannot be a single soul on board that yacht. They can't ma maintain it. They can't service it. Nothing. And if if there's crew on board, even just to meet insurance requirements, that crew is actually breaking the law by just being on board. Yeah, certainly for any private company to provide or, or person to provide that service, so whether it's a crew being on board, um, then yes, they would be so that would be sanctioned, and that would make them what's called an associated person, um, which would open them to being penalised for providing services to that um, to that to the sanctioned person. Whether, whether the government who freezes that asset can maintain it, put people on board, you know, have a watchkeeper, or but that wouldn't you know and effectively look after that asset whilst they decide what to do with it. Um, I guess that a government could well do that and would be protecting, you know, the environment and the safety of the wherever that yacht is. Um, but for a private person and equally insurers, etc., yes, every, everything has to be withdrawn. It's, so that uh, means that we have these floating palaces that are getting mooring fees for wherever they're moored at the time. So the that company will have to, you know, I guess, eat the fees of that boat taking up the space um, at their docks, but yet there's nobody on board to maintain it. So isn't this an asset that will quickly fall in value because a super yacht needs maintenance daily, consistently. I mean, it rains. They need to everything to be wiped down, to yeah. wash down right away because there are so many things on board that can be damaged if it's left. Is this not going to be a problem if in the future these assets have to be handed back or these uh, assets have to be sold? Are, are they not running the risk of losing massive amounts of money based on this asset? Or when they are returned, will they be sued to make payment for whatever needs to be fixed? It's, it's a really unprecedented situation we've always had sanctions but I don't, I don't think to the extent and that the, the oligarchs have had um, investments and, and assets in west in, in the countries that are now sanctioning them because of the the war in Ukraine um, and yeah I guess the governments are going to either decide to sell those assets off um, or potentially maintain them in a position so they can. I mean, mooring fee, yeah, for for marinas and people with mooring fees, they have a right to be to be paid and and can take a lien over the assets. So it it really is, yeah, very interesting times, and it's going to be um, 
how this plays out and whether those assets are sold off will be will be interesting because we don't know how long these sanctions will remain in place. Uh, I think for the industry, the the other piece that's difficult is often knowing who's behind these assets, and and I think that for you know for in, in financial services businesses, um, they're fairly used to looking for sanctioned people and looking for flow of money and understanding who the who their client is and where the money is coming from. But for non-financial services businesses, where you're a provisioner, whether you're a bunkering, yacht management, brokers, um, they're really going to have to be doing more checks and more compliance on who's behind you know, someone buying a yacht or who are they selling the yacht for. They really need to know who it is because if it is a sanctioned person, um, they're opening themselves up to be penalized. It, you know, ignorance isn't isn't a defense. Isn't this an issue that comes right to the actual build of the yacht, whether or not it be now or whether it had been five years ago? Companies have been warned for years that they need to do due diligence on the money coming in to pay for any yacht, whether it be brokerage or whether it be build. Um, so now that we're seeing these sanctions put in place and the governments are going to be looking through this pathway of money, as it were, with a fine tooth comb. Do you think there could be other repercussions? Uh, yeah, I think I think certainly if people haven't got those in place, they they need to really uh, invest in their compliance resource. And those people are becoming very critical to your business and and the risk surrounding your business. Um, it's you, you have to know where those funds are coming from, and um, you know. I think the sanctions have just taken that to a to another level of of really needed to understand that flow of funds. Um, you know, it's always been there in the banks. Banks should be checking this as well and knowing who who they're dealing with, and knowing where those funds are. Um, certainly, some of my experience in the last week is there's been more questions of just on small payments on to you know people like yacht registries and saying, well. Can you send me the invoice for that? And just just wanting a bit more detail. So I think that's also you know, commercially an area people will need to uh, accept or understand that you know, transferring money, even if it's legitimate, could take longer. And it's you know planning that and into your process is probably well worth it. Do you think what kind of sort of Capabilities, the crew, like, for example, if the crew are fired halfway through a month or, you know, a week out and they're owed a week's salary, where do they go? You know, they've been turfed off a boat because, of course, the boat has been sanctioned and there's absolutely no money coming in or out. Are they out that salary or is there ways that they can go about recouping their loss? Uh, it's d difficult. I mean, I think, obviously, uh, Nautilus and and the unions have been encouraging people to to join if they're not joined and and you know, have helped seafarers in in the past recoup uh, monies that they're owing. You would hope in this situation uh, that that people are paid for the work they've done up until the date they're they're uh, let go. But it, I guess it depends if their employment company has been funded and has those funds to to pay them out the notice period that that's in their contract. Um, uh, because you know, yeah, equally they're they if that's sanctioned funds, then you know they would probably have to get clearance on whether they can do that. Uh, and there will be channels for those companies to go through. You know, most jurisdictions will have a you know a financial you know, investigations unit or service um, which you know, those you know, companies can talk to in terms of. Are they allowed to release funds or not? Certainly banks and things will have their compliance people talking and saying, we have these funds, can we release them to pay the crew? Um, as I said, I think there could be more delays in in those payment processes as banks check and you know where the money's coming from and to and make sure they're not exposing themselves to these sanctions. And we was, we've also seen in the UK a, a commitment to accelerate um, on actually having an asset register for who owns property in the UK and who owns these assets um, and beefing up companies' house, which has always been relatively um, 
lax in terms of proving who you know, any you, you're supposed to tell who's owning a company, but there's never been any checks before. I think we'll see those beneficial ownership checks um, become more stringent. We've certainly seen that in other jurisdictions. Um, Malta, as an example, was was heavily criticised for not um, having full beneficial ownership information, and, and I know they've they've been doing a lot of checking of the corporate service providers in Malta to to ensure that they've got the information they should have. Um, in other companies, the countries like the Crown Dependencies of you know, Guernsey and Jersey, they have a full, you know, everybody who owns a company has to provide full client due diligence and source of funds. So that is held by someone who's regulated on, on those islands. It's quite a high standard. Well, let me ask you about crew. If indeed they have to hire a lawyer and they have to take you know, a bunch of different steps to try and recoup any losses of wages, are they able to claim those costs in tax? Um, that's a good qu- question. I guess if they're paying, uh, I guess for the for crew would be t- depend on where they're paying tax. Um, uh, certainly, I mean, I think the first actual point would would, would be in it, that you would look to claim those damages back from your employer eventually. Um, but like anything legal, it's going. It's you know taking legal action is expensive. You have to have a lawyer. You have to often fund those yourself. It's it's not an easy, um, not an easy and, and quick uh, resolution. And particularly when uh, you're in this sort of situation, or you might not know who the who the real owner is behind, you know, or you're employed by a third party company. So if you're employed by the boat, then the best recourse is to go after the boat. But if you're employed by a third party company, then the best resource is to go back to the third party company. I think the reality is that the yacht will always be the asset that is secured um, because it's there. It's in the same jurisdiction. Certainly we've seen that in, in France where action's been taken for hidden, what's called hidden employment, where people aren't being paid their social security. Um, regardless of the employment might be elsewhere, um, but often the, the authorities in, in the port where the yacht is will say, well, no, actually you're here in our jurisdiction. The yacht's here. We'll deal with it here. Um, and once the yacht's been arrested, that becomes a, a local jurisdiction matter where wherever, wherever the employment is. Well, you know, I mean, it just keeps going. We've had quite a few sort of, it's been seized, it's not been seized, yet the entire crew has been let go. Um, it's been quite a confusing couple of weeks. Um, and then, of course, this weekend, the Italian government is sanctioning two yachts um, within hours of each other. Do you think we're going to see more yep. sanctions, more, more yachts being seized in the next little while? Uh, if If the... If the war can, continues and there isn't a, a peace option broker or some negotiation, then I think, yeah, the sanctions are going to uh, be get more and more and, and to try and put more pressure on on the Russians to negotiate and, and stop what they're doing in, in Ukraine. Um, well, I think we've got another interesting few weeks coming up. I know for sure that there's, uh, I think within the next 24 hours, there's supposed to be talks again between Ukraine and Russia. And, you know, I mean, I think the whole world is crossing their fingers and toes that they will come to a ceasefire and come to some sort of agreement so that troops withdraw from Ukraine and um, life can go back to normal because these sanctions are affecting the Russian people. And it's not the Russian people really that, that Ukraine is, is at war with. It, it is one person. Um, and that's the shame of it, is that uh, the Russian people uh, are, you know, the, everything. I, I don't know if you've seen the news reports, but, you know, pretty much all, any sort of shopping has been shut down that is owned by outside companies. The, the ruble is, is um, at the lowest point it's ever been in history, ever. Um, so, you know, it's, it's going to affect the people of Russia and just be honest, hardworking, go to work every day, come home and look after your family kind of people. Yeah, um, it is, and that's that's the uh, terrible sadness in war, isn't it? You know, in any war, there's there's a lot of innocents who are impacted. Um, 
obviously we've seen the, the number of refugees leaving Ukraine and and the people who are staying and and likewise uh, you know, I'm sure there's a, a lot of crew who you know, haven't done anything wrong but have now found themselves out of a out of a job be, you know, because the, the yacht sanctioned and they can no longer work on it it's a very um, very sad and unnecessary situation unfortunately and we can only well, hope it that it's yeah, and these sanctions, realistically, I mean, you're looking at somebody who's worth 30 billion and they lose a yacht or, you know, with these sanctions and the financial sanctions going on, all of a sudden they're not worth 30 billion, they're worth 20 billion. When you're talking about regular people, these sanctions, it's whether or not they can have three meals a day or one meal a day. You know, the difference between 30 billion in your lifestyle and 20 billion in your lifestyle, honestly, is not that great. There's no change. Uh, yeah, I, I do think it's worth. I think the yachts are very. You know, it's a, it always has been, and it always will be. A high, it's a high-profile asset. It makes a great headline. I think you know, equally, there'll be estates, as we've seen in Italy. It was not just the yachts; it was also um, villas and etc. That were. Um, you know, this will not just be hitting the yacht asset. It will be hitting their property assets. It'll be hitting their funds, their banking. You know, that person is. You know, effectively, any assets in those countries is frozen, um, and you know that's why I think the West is, hopes that sanctions will will be effective. Is that so much of the the wealth of these oligarchs has been invested overseas or is in Western countries, the US and the UK and and Europe, um, and and perhaps that's you know where we'll see the pressure go go on that, that actually it is impacting that li that lifestyle and those assets. Um, I know there's, you know, banks, will, you know, where even where, you know, money's been cheap. So even if you've got the cash, often you can invest the cash and use that elsewhere and buy the asset and take a loan um, for a property in London. If your bank's now saying, well, I'm not going to re renew that loan and it's coming up in six months, then you've got a problem. You've got to find yeah. that cash somewhere and if all your assets are frozen. So, I, you know, I do think it's it's wider than just the yacht um, and and hopefully, you know, these these people who are being sanctioned uh, can can exert some pressure or, or you know, and I think that's the important thing is actually how do you find a, a, a way out that is, is not going to, or is going to leave, you know, Putin with some pride or, or an exit that's not, you know, that's going to be acceptable to him. Um, uh, and that's, that's the real challenge for all of us, I think. Yeah, well, hopefully that uh, we do, as I mentioned, we see a change in the near future. You know, even cryptocurrency right now, there's a big discussion in the US in regards to cryptocurrency. Um, and they're saying that, um, there's no way the cryptocurrency companies themselves are now withdrawing any service to Russia. So, you know, the gone are the days, I think. And I think we're going to talk about cryptocurrency and, and um, you know, uh, yeah, about that next week because it's very interesting. Like, but it's interesting to see that these companies that literally when they started up back in 2008, 2009, and it was starting to become a thing, um, they were sort of seen as outside the banking world, outside, untouchable by governments. Nobody could touch them. And obviously, in order to grow as big as they've grown to this day, they do have to abide by certain laws. And we're seeing that now with the situation with Russia. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to buy a yacht with cryptocurrency or you know, with any currency, you're going to need to, you know, it. it it's still a means of payment. It needs to be, you know, if you're accepting that money in as a buyer, you want to know where it's coming from. And there are ways of, you know, validating whether the cryptocurrency, whether it's for a yacht or a, or a property, but you need to be able to prove where that's come from. And um, you know, the blockchain that crypto is built on, actually one of the, the real assets of it is, is you can trace it. There is an audit trail of where it's come from. Um, and I, you know, I think most people who are, accepting that for property purchases, yacht purchases, will be putting those checks in place to, to know we can absolutely know where this crypto is coming from to pay for this asset. Because you don't want to be sitting going, or someone goes, well, I, I can't take that money from you. A, a bit like having a forged banknote. You know, in yeah. simple terms, it's the same. If you can't prove 
that, that that money is legitimate or that cryptocurrency is legitimate, you're not going to be able to use it. Um, yeah. And we're talking big, big funds and big amounts. <laughs> yes. Very big. More and more bigger amounts than I'll ever see in my life. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, yeah. Alistair, thank you this. again for your time. It's really appreciated. Well, no, thanks for the questions. And it's always a pleasure, Ria, to speak. Um, I just hope we see something change. It's, it's uh, in some ways quite surreal to see the world and, you know, and, and this unfold. And it's, um, yeah, I certainly personally, I find it quite you know, hard for to see the impact on people, normal people who have two weeks, three weeks ago, we're going about their normal lives. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, fingers crossed it all changed. Next week, we'll be talking about cryptocurrency. So you guys, please do tune in if you're interested in investing in cryptocurrency because Alistair is, well, he will be the leading authority on it by Monday. <laughs> I'm learning fast, Ria. <laughs> I look forward to it. <laughs> You've been watching another episode of Talking Take Sense. Care with Alistair Milroy from Breaking the Mold Accounting. My name is Ria. I have been your co-host. We'll see you again next week. <laughs>